My name is William Michael of the Classical Liberal Arts Academy, and today is Thursday, August 12th. A friend wrote uh, a day ago and asked if I would be willing to devote one of my walk talks to the topic of classical astronomy. Classical astronomy. And I'm happy to do so, and um, I think I understand why uh, there'd be a question about classical astronomy, because for all of the talk of classical studies today, for all of the talk of of, um, classical Catholic education, there really aren't many people who who are willing to do the work and seek expertise in these studies. They don't desire them for their own sake, but they only desire them as far as it's necessary for them to stay one step ahead of students and and serve a, a school community or, or other parents. And so the real subjects, the higher subjects, the depths of the subjects, Um, are left untouched. And while we can find a million people to talk about the value of studying Latin and Greek or logic, um, and even these talks are usually just superficial and kind of shallow and and not really um, a good representation of real classical studies, we find less and less said as we move into the advanced arts and sciences because these people don't study the arts and sciences and they have nothing to say. So when we come especially to the quadrivium, the four mathematical arts of the classical liberal arts, we find very little spoken uh, because you really have to get into the depths of of classical history, uh, classical philosophy, Um, to to understand the principles that these sciences are based on, these arts are based on. And there aren't many people willing to do that because there's no financial benefit in doing so, at least not at this time. So you can scour the internet, you can Google it and search around, but you'll find very little on the four arts uh, of the of the quadrivium, the four mathematical arts. Uh, most, most people working in classical education really don't even know where to start those studies. And as I said, since there's no, no demand in the homeschool market or in the private school market, no one's going to attend to them because the interest in the classical liberal arts is not pure for the sake of wisdom, but it's, it's for the sake of having something to teach in a school that can earn someone a paycheck. And that's why the classical studies will never advance. But in the Classical Liberal Arts Academy, we're actually seeking, or I should say I'm actually seeking, to not only pursue these studies myself for their own sake, for the sake of wisdom, uh, but also to present the entire curriculum of studies to students, even when those students are ready to study them. And so in classical astronomy, um, we seek to understand what the ancients, what the wise men taught about the heavens. Uh, We seek to understand not only what they taught, but why they taught it, because in in modern circles, uh, the teaching of the ancients is often dismissed as Um, obsolete or disproven when no such proving has ever been done. And then it gets misrepresented by people who've never studied it, but appoint themselves as uh, its representatives. And they usually make a clown show out of it, like modern um, geocentrists and modern flat earthers pretending that that they believe in ancient astronomy when they really have no idea what the ancient philosophers taught or why they taught it. So, in this talk, I'm going to take up this topic of ancient astronomy, talk about it a bit, explain the sources that we study to learn classical astronomy, 
talk a bit about how it differs from modern astronomy, and then I'll provide some uh, some interesting considerations that might make it worth studying for those who are interested. So to begin, if we were to ask the question, what is classical astronomy? And we can look at it from two different angles. First, we could look at it from the perspective of um, Aristotelian philosophy, And we can say that that classical astronomy is the pursuit or the investigation of the heavens, the desire to understand uh, what the heavens contain, uh, what the celestial bodies do, how they move, uh, things like that. Uh, Simple philosophical investigation. And we find this investigation undertaken by Aristotle in his work titled On the heavens, on the heavens. In Latin, the title is De Cielo, C-A-E-L-O, De Cielo. And if we read Aristotle's work on the heavens, we'll see the, the, the presentation of the classical astronomy or the system and understanding of the heavenly bodies, of the heavens. And this was... This was already developed and taught to some degree by Plato, um, but it was considered perfected by Aristotle and became the standard uh, understanding of the heavens from the time Aristotle wrote on it, around 350 BC, until the famous um, Copernican Revolution, which took place in the 1500s. So we're talking a view of the heavens that was held and taught by history's wisest and holiest men um, for 1,800 years at least. And this is why when when we see modern scientists or, or modern students just dismissing it as something that's silly, we can... We can laugh at these people because this is a doctrine that was held by wise men for over 1,800 years. And let's just take a second to think about that. By his investigation, in the presence of so much much accountability in the ancient philosophical community, Aristotle developed his science of astronomy and published it through his teaching, but also through his his treatise on the heavens. We really don't find any refutation or objection to anything that Aristotle taught. Again, as critical as that philosopher's culture was, we really find no objection or challenge to Aristotle's astronomy. And that should, that should make us pause when we feel provoked to criticize it lazily or casually. If we think that Aristotle published his astronomy before 300 B.C., And when the Christian era dawned, we find Christ doing nothing to challenge or point out errors in the widely held astronomy of that time. We don't find the apostles making any effort to correct the errors of the classical astronomy. We find no contradiction to the classical astronomy in the sacred scriptures. And this goes on all through medieval Catholic history. The church fathers present no objections. They don't raise any doubts about the Aristotelian system of astronomy. Um, We get to 
St. Thomas Aquinas and St. Albert the Great, especially St. Albert the Great, who was very interested in, in natural philosophy. We find no objection from a wise man like Albert the Great. We find no objections from St. Thomas Aquinas. Rather, we find the reinforcement of Aristotle's teaching from these men. And this continues on and on for another two, three hundred years until finally someone raises an objection. And so we have to consider, is this objection really legitimate? Is this objection really a true philosophical objection to the content of Aristotle's teaching, or is there something else at play that requires men to move away from Aristotle's view of the heavens? As Catholics, we have to look back and say, are we really so sure that the astronomy that was embraced by men like St. Augustine, St. Albert the Great, St. Thomas Aquinas was just completely wrong? And as we talk about this a little bit, we'll see why this modern abandonment of classical astronomy really doesn't make a whole lot of sense. This afternoon, a lady on Facebook posted and asked, So, are you a geocentrist? And I just want to say up front, when, when modern people who have never studied ancient philosophy say things like that, what they're trying to do is they're trying to pretend that they have some kind of knowledge of these subjects. They'll, what they want to do is, is they want to label you with, some, with some, some label that allows them to pretend like they know what you believe and that they've already considered it and found it wanting. So they'll want to ask you, are you a geocentrist? Now, geocentrism, which means that the earth is the center of the physical universe, when spoken of in a modern community of of common people, won't have a clear definition. This is the first problem. I mean, as, as simple and as lazy as we can get, It'll be difficult even to find people who can tell you what they mean by the term geocentrism. For example, do you mean that the Earth is said to be at the center of the entire universe? Or do you mean that the Earth is said to be at the center of the solar system? These are two different things. And you'll, you'll find the term used sloppily with no real definition because these people aren't really interested in this knowledge. That's why they don't study the philosophy themselves. They just talk about it. They'll pass around Wikipedia articles or YouTube videos. But none of them are serious enough to actually go and study the sources. And so, if anyone asks you a question like that, trying to label you in these topics, just ignore them and tell them that's not how philosophy works. I just want to say that up front because As people listen to this, I'm sure that they're going to immediately start trying to apply some label to what I'm saying, and I'm not granting uh, the truth of any such label. If you want to know what what I teach and what I think, then you're going to need to study all of these courses. You're going to need to ask me specific questions about specific points of doctrine, And if you're not willing to do that, then I have no interest in having those discussions. So we have to realize, as I was saying, that this classical doctrine of the heavens was unchallenged for 1,800 years, all through the history and founding of the Catholic Church. We find no objections or challenges to it until the Copernican Revolution way down the road. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. But in 
Aristotle's work on the heavens, what, what's most important that has to be understood is that Aristotle teaches about the heavenly bodies and their motions and, and so on, but he does so with proofs. He doesn't just assert his ideas, he doesn't propose theories. He's not just standing in the front yard and saying, you know, what I think is that the sun, blah, 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 and the stars are like this, and that's not what Aristotle's doing. He's not just pitching some possible idea. Aristotle is starting from the elements of natural philosophy and what can be known of the elements of natural philosophy, and he's reasoning through them to conclusions about the heavens. And everything that he says in these books, everything that he says, he offers proofs for. And that's why it's so ridiculous when people easily dismiss classical astronomy, is that they they seem to think that this was just a scheme suggested as a theory by the ancient philosophers. And we can easily dismiss it as one that doesn't satisfy um, our judgment. But that's not what classical astronomy was. As I said, classical astronomy, the, the, the principles of classical astronomy were drawn from the principles of natural philosophy. And so, before you can even get into the discussion of classical astronomy, you're going to have had to have studied Aristotle's physics first, where he presents the general principles of natural philosophy. So, it's really not fair for anyone to jump into the work on the heavens and pretend that they're following along when that book and and the principles of it depend on a prior knowledge which the reader wouldn't have. The study of natural philosophy begins with the study of Aristotle's physics. In the physics, Aristotle presents the general principles of natural philosophy. And then when we get to the work on the heavens, Aristotle then takes those general principles and applies them to the specific questions about the nature and movements and activities of the heavenly bodies. And so we can't just jump into astronomy. In the Classical Liberal Arts Academy, which has been open now for 13 years, hardly any students have even started the study of Aristotle's physics mainly because their parents pressure them with modern K-12 requirements and they just never even get a chance to listen to philosophy Um, and because there's no material or monetary value in the study of it, it's just dismissed as unnecessary. And that's how modern education works. If it can't be turned into cash, it's not worth pursuing. But we'd have to study classical physics before anyone would be prepared to study um, classical astronomy. Now, in the classical astronomy course in the Classical Liberal Arts Academy, I start by teaching Aristotle's work on the heavens. And if you even were to look at the first few lessons of the classical astronomy course, you would see that Aristotle gets right to work from the very beginning of his work on the heavens, starting with principles that were established in the physics and reasoning from them to additional necessary conclusions. And this is how the science of astronomy develops in Aristotle's teachings. I'll give you a simple example. Aristotle says that there are only three kinds of simple 
movement. There are only three kinds of simple movement. And and that's movement away from the center of a thing, movement towards the center, and movement about the center, or circular movement. So there's movement in a straight line in one of two directions, and then there's circular movement. And that these are the only three natural or simple movements. Aristotle then looks at the four elements which are established in natural philosophy, fire, air, water, and earth. And he says that each of these four elements moves in a straight line. Fire and air move upwards, away from the center. Water and earth move downwards or towards the center. And so even though there's three kinds of simple movement, in the four elements of the earth, we find only two kinds of movements, up and down, to put it simply. And therefore Aristotle says, surely this third natural movement must take place somewhere in nature. Therefore, there must be some other element outside of the earth or outside of our immediate physical world, which has as its natural motion circular movement. He also argues that circular movement is perfect and therefore prior to straight or linear movement. And therefore, not only is this circular movement necessary, but it's actually prior to linear movement. And so Aristotle concludes from these principles of natural philosophy that there must be some body, some simple body that has been created that has as its natural motion circular movement. And this body, whatever it is, this simple body or element, must exist in the universe, but it does not exist on earth. And therefore Aristotle concludes that we should look for this fifth element or this fifth kind of natural or simple body in the heavens. And we should expect it to have circular motion as its natural movement. So you can see Aristotle is not just throwing ideas together like a kid telling a story. There are reasons why he teaches and concludes what he does. And if anyone wants to dismiss his conclusions, they're going to have to point out the errors, either in the assertions that he makes, the principles that he reasons from, or they're going to have to point out flaws in his actual arguments. And what I say to anyone who thinks they can do that is, good luck. Good luck. Now, today earlier today, because I started to talk about what I was going to talk about in this talk, I I posted a question and said that Aristotle says that circular motion of the heavenly bodies is a natural and simple motion. And the only way that that might not be true is if we could prove that the motion of the heavenly bodies was in fact unnatural motion. And so I asked if anybody thought that the movement of the celestial bodies might be unnatural or that it might be caused by constraint, by the influence of some, something else. And one of my friends rightly suggested that this is what modern scientists have argued, and they've said that the force of gravity is this external influence 
that causes the heavenly bodies to, uh, to move in a circular orbit around other heavenly bodies. And that's true. The theory of gravity is an attempt to get rid of Aristotle's teaching of natural circular movement. And so while modern society may laugh at anyone who questions the theory of gravity, what they don't seem to understand is that if they accept the theory of gravity to be true, then that would mean that there is no natural circular motion in the universe. And that would lead to philosophical problems. But in modern science, no one cares about the philosophical consequences of different ideas. Any theory is accepted as possible. And there's no philosopher standing around judging it saying, no, that's probably not going to work because if that's true, then these other things must also be true and you're going to run into all kinds of problems. When science is left without any examination from philosophers, there are many things that seem like they might be true, which a philosopher would know cannot be true. And that's one of the problems of modern science. The people doing the scientific theorizing and experimentation are men who, for the most part in modern society, have never studied the art of reasoning or the philosophical sciences before they started putting together theories of how everything works. So Aristotle's astronomy is not just a child's explanation of how the world works or where everything came from. It's not some kind of ancient uh, mythological story where some narrative or fable was created by a poet to explain things and give an explanation for why things are the way they are based on some, some story. Everything that Aristotle says is inferred from physical or philosophical principles that have already been established. And that's why dismissing Aristotle's philosophy is, is really not serious, unless we're going to deal with all of those proofs that, argue, that Aristotle offers when he makes his conclusions. So, in the work on the heavens, and I'm not going to say much more about this because if you're really interested in this teaching, rather than listen to a one-hour talk and then go and pretend like you know things, you need to study Aristotle's work. You need to study the physics, and you need to study his work on the heavens, and not pretend you've studied something that you haven't. So the classical astronomy course in the Classical Liberal Arts Academy begins with the study of Aristotle's work on the heavens. Now, this, wor this work is primarily a philosophical exercise, but if we look at the Classical Liberal Arts curriculum, we find astronomy listed as one of the four mathematical arts. And this requires us to zoom in a little or understand more perfectly exactly what astronomy is. And again, this is all based on the ancient art of reasoning, Aristotle's categories, and so on. And so what I, what I want to make clear is that if we decide we're going to reject a part of this classical philosophical system or these seven classical liberal arts, in a modern society where no one even cares about these things, we can make these suggestions and not have to face the consequences because no one is going to call us to give an account for implications of ideas 
that we promote or implications of ideas we deny that were held by men in ancient times. The fact that men who couldn't couldn't last for one minute with Thomas Aquinas in any kind of debate or discussion think to easily dismiss the philosophy of his age because it's so obvious that this or that is otherwise is just is just silly. So when we look at this subject of classical astronomy, we see it listed with the mathematical arts. And the mathematical arts correspond to what Aristotle explained in his work on the categories. Different categories of of ideas that exist in the world. Um, And one of those categories was quantity. Quantity, which answers the question, how many or how much? And Aristotle shows that there are two basic divisions of quantity. One is multitude and the other is magnitude. And I explained all of this in my talk on ancient or classical mathematics. But we have quantity as a genus divided into two species multitudes and magnitudes, and then each of these two species divides into two subspecies. Multitude divides into absolute and relative multitudes. Magnitudes divides into magnitudes at rest and magnitudes in motion. Astronomy in this system of the classical liberal arts is simply the investigation or the art of magnitude in motion. That's what astronomy is. The study of the principles of magnitude in motion. And it's called astronomy because while the science, the philosophical art, is general, it has a unique application to the study of the heavens. And therefore, astronomy is the name given to this fourth mathematical art, the study of magnitude in motion. Now, since it's the study of magnitude in motion, and since motion comes after rest, because motion in the classical idea is is a change of place, locomotion, change of place, rest, which is a location or place comes first and then change of place naturally comes after. So magnitudes at rest are considered to be prior to magnitudes in motion. And the study of astronomy as a mathematical art assumes the knowledge of the art of geometry, which is a simpler mathematical art. Again, one of the reasons we haven't started teaching astronomy in the academy until this year is because students hadn't worked through geometry. And rather than just fake it and create some course and give it a fancy name like classical astronomy, I've told the students plainly, you cannot study classical astronomy until you understand the principles of classical geometry. That's just a fact. If you don't do that, You're going to go and start playing around with astronomy, pretending you understand things that you really don't understand. And we get this fake scholarship that's the plague of modern society. People just pretending to understand things for the sake of a job or a title. So if you want to study classical astronomy, you need to study first classical geometry. And in the Classical Liberal Arts Academy... We're just getting there in our history. We're just getting to the point where some of our brightest and most committed students are making their way through these arts and are qualifying themselves to take up the study of these, um, these, these more advanced 
arts and sciences. Now, when we look to this study of classical geometry as a mathematical art, we don't look to Aristotle for the source of this doctrine, but we look to the writings of Claudius Ptolemaeus. We look to a book titled The Almagest, or Almagestum in Latin, by an author who in English is referred to as Ptolemy. And it's worth noting that the name Ptolemy actually begins with a P. It's P-T-O-L-E-M-Y. So you could pronounce it more exactly as Ptolemy. But normally it's spoken as simply Ptolemy. So Ptolemy's Almagest is the actual demonstration of the elements of astronomy. Just as Euclid's geometry contains the demonstration of the principles of the art of geometry, so Ptolemy's Almagest presents to us the principles of the art of astronomy with their mathematical demonstration. Now, Ptolemy assumes the truth of Aristotle's system and understanding of the heavens. Ptolemy simply adds to Aristotle's philosophy the mathematical demonstration of it. And this brings us back again to think about those who just dismiss ancient astronomy as childish fables and nonsense. Not only was the system of the ancient astronomy established by Aristotle himself, not only was it held for 1,800 years, but it was also demonstrated mathematically by Ptolemy in the Almagest. And that's why this careless, silly modern dismissal is not to be taken seriously. I've probably mentioned this before, but C.S. Lewis coined a phrase, uh, coined the phrase chronological snobbery, chronological snobbery, to refer to the fallacy whereby one easily dismisses some other idea simply because it's old. And when it comes to astronomy, that's really what we have in modern circles. We have an ignorant and irresponsible dismissing of an ancient understanding of the heavens without any proof that it's actually false, without any actual evidence or justification for that dismissal. It's, it's easily dismissed simply because it's old. It's not popular. It's not what the modern society wants to be true of the heavens. Modern society doesn't want the earth to be at rest at the center of the universe. We don't want to start with that as our reference point. For some reason, modern men desire to place the point of reference for all astronomical comparisons, relations, and measurements at some other point in the heavens. And there's no justification for doing this. Really, it doesn't make any sense. Einstein, in his work on the evolution of physics, explains quite simply that the Ptolemaic system and the Copernican system are simply two different systems. I forget the term that he actually used off the top of my head. I'll probably think of it soon. But Einstein said that they're simply two different coordinate systems. That might have been what he said. Two different coordinate systems, two different schemes that differ only because the point of reference is different between them. Many people who talk about the Aristotelian astronomy or the Ptolemaic astronomy really don't even understand what the issues are and what Copernican 
astronomy is even about. Neither of these... Well, I, sh- I, sh- I shouldn't say neither of these. The Copernican system claims absolutely that its observations are true and that the denial of them is necessarily false. And of course, this cannot be proven. If we were going to choose one of these two systems to understand the universe, and we were to grant that either of them could be considered true and simply thought of as different different perspectives on the same heavenly bodies, if we were to ask if either could be true, which of the two would be better? Then some will say the Copernican system, because it makes for simpler mathematical calculations, as if the simplicity of mathematical calculations is is some kind of end above other ends. But there are arguments to be made also for the ancient astronomy. We could argue that when God chose to speak to us, he chose to present to us an understanding of the heavens that agrees with the classical or Aristotelian system of astronomy. He could have chosen, if he wanted, to reveal to us the Copernican model and reference everything around the sun, as Copernicus did. But he chose instead to present to us the image of the earth being at rest and the heavenly bodies moving about the earth in circular motion. And so we have to give some acknowledgement to the fact that when it was time for God to reveal truth to us, which included truth about the creation of the world, he did not present to us a Copernican model to think about, but was content to leave us with the Aristotelian or ancient model. There was no need in the Holy Spirit's judgment to correct the ancient teaching about the heavens. And we have to consider that as well when we listen to people casually dismiss it as disproven and ridiculous and obsolete. That's not true. Now, the reason why I don't like to accept the label of geocentrism is because for modern people who claim to be geocentrists, they usually don't know the philosophical context of Aristotle's astronomy. And therefore, they say many things that are that are untrue. They make statements and arguments that can be proven false, and they misrepresent the Aristotelian philosophy. They cause it to appear flawed, and those who argue with them are really not concerned with disproving Aristotle. They're just concerned with disproving their present opponents, which is quite easy. And that's why people who sit around watching YouTube videos about geocentrism or reading Wikipedia articles, I don't like to let them label me because they're trying to attach me to some other person who can be refuted and pretend that because he's been refuted, I am also necessarily refuted because I'm like him. And this modern labeling method is a distraction. If you want to know what I believe and what I teach, you're going to need to read Aristotle's philosophy and Ptolemy's Almagest. The Almagest, just to give you a a simple idea, as far as I know, is only available in English translation in a modern book. 
I think the translator's name was Toomer, T-O-O-M-E-R, and you can read an English translation of Ptolemy's Almagest, but I believe you're going to have to pay for it because it's not available in the public domain. It's a relatively new work, a new translation, but it is available. I have a copy. Um, it is available, and I believe that in the CLAA, in the resources, I, I have shared a link to a PDF copy that's available online. But it is available in English translation, and it begins, Ptolemy's Alma just begins, by simply taking for granted Aristotle's teaching on the heavens and furnishing proof for them. Furnishes proof for Aristotle's teaching using geometry as its method. And that's why it's included in the mathematical arts. So these two works, Aristotle's Treatise on the Heavens and Ptolemy's Almagest, are the two great sources for our knowledge of classical astronomy. And no one can claim to know classical astronomy until he's demonstrated his knowledge of these two ancient sources. Now, while these are the two formal sources of ancient astronomy, there are many secondary sources. Though these are less systematic and not really to be considered a source for learning astronomy, but it's important for us to see how people in the ancient world understood the heavens and applied these philosophical teachings to all different kinds of thoughts and contexts, circumstances, and so on. For example, anytime you read any ancient literature, whether it's Homer's Iliad or Virgil's Aeneid or Ovid's Metamorphoses, anytime you're reading ancient literature, you should pay attention for astronomical references. This is true also of the Bible. If you're reading the Bible or Homer or Ovid or Virgil or Thucydides or Herodotus or anyone else, you should pay attention for any references to astronomical information. For example, when you read the authors talking about the sun or the moon or the stars or the planets, eclipses, and so on, you should pay attention because you see they're talking about the heavens within the context of that ancient astronomy. And you can see how the ancient astronomy affects their ideas about the heavens. This is most clear in sacred scripture. If you read Genesis chapter 1, where God reveals to us the order of creation through Moses, he says that the sun, moon, and stars were designed to serve as signs for days and for years and for seasons, and so on. They were designed also to give light to the earth, but also to mark signs in the heavens. And that's where time originates. Time, as far as human beings are concerned, begins with the creation of of the celestial bodies because they were actually created by God for the purpose of keeping time, serving as signs of time. And so we can see that the study of astronomy now relates to the study of time as a philosophical subject. And again, if we're going to dismiss ancient philosophy, are we also going to dismiss ancient ideas about time and place, signs and seasons? 
these are the kinds of consequences that modern people are not accountable to because they simply don't know what the implications would be of things they think or say. Whereas philosophers would know better. And that's why it's so important for us to read philosophy. Anytime we read in philosophy, especially Aristotle, we'll find positive proofs offered for the propositions and assertions that he makes. But we'll often also find demonstrations of the impossibility of other opinions. And many of these opinions that Aristotle demonstrates to be impossible, and remember, he gives reasons for this, are the common ideas of our generation. So if we were to present modern ideas to Aristotle, he wouldn't be amazed by them as if he had never thought of them, or as if they were difficult to understand. He would simply have reasons why he didn't accept that position and chose the position that he did as a superior and more perfect explanation. So we can study the formal sources in Aristotle's On the Heavens and Ptolemy's Almagest. We can also gather lots of astronomical information from the reading of other works like Sacred Scripture, the writings of Homer and Virgil, Ovid, Herodotus, Thucydides, on and on. Many different sources for us to glean knowledge of the ancient view of the heavens. So those are the first two points that I said I would try to discuss. And now the third, which is how modern science differs from this ancient philosophy. In modern science, everything is based on reproducible experiments or true observations. There's no system of philosophy to which scientists are held accountable. When it's time to theorize, they're allowed to say whatever they want with no philosophical accountability, what the implications might be. It usually takes a philosopher outside of the scientific community to point out the philosophical implications of different ideas. A perfect example of this is in the church and the controversies that arise as science quote-unquote discovers something and is ready to run with it because it can And it takes the church to say, whoa, 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 hold on a second. This is a moral crisis that you've created here. Just because you can create this chemical that prevents a woman from conceiving, just because you can do this, doesn't mean that you should do this. And so we find that the capabilities of the scientific investigation of the world are often shut down by the philosophical investigation of the world. There's more to this life than just doing what we want to do. We also have to consider the common good. We also have to consider the will of God. The fact that this is His universe, His planet, His natural resource. We're His people not our own. Just because we can do something doesn't mean that we should do something. And this this language even reminds us of the Garden of Eden, where Adam and Eve could eat the forbidden fruit, but that didn't mean that they should eat the forbidden fruit. Could and should are two very different things. And Modern science likes to live outside of the reach of this philosophical accountability. 
That's one of the reasons why it pushes for a math-based approach to research, why the scientific method itself was proposed as the method that should be employed to study the world, because non-Catholics don't want to be accountable to Catholic doctrine or scholastic philosophy. And the only way to get themselves free from those restraining influences is to cast them off completely, which is why in modern schools there's so much emphasis on mathematics and absolutely none on reasoning. That's not an accident. That was done intentionally. Reasoning is a tool of the Catholic Church. And anyone who is an enemy of the Catholic Church wants to destroy the art of reasoning. That's why it was at the time of the Renaissance, the Protestant Reformation, and so on, that the idea of the quote-unquote scientific method, all of a sudden rises out of nowhere as if no one had ever thought of that before. The truth is, many people had thought of that before. They just didn't believe it was wise or moral to subject our understanding of all things to physical observations. That could easily be demonstrated to be false. And so we have here, in an overview, the classical astronomy and then the attempt to replace it with a modern astronomy that considers almost nothing of the history of the ancient astronomy and urges its immediate dismissal regardless of its centuries and centuries of acceptance by wise, examining men. There are a number of reasons why anti-Catholic men are zealous for the modern astronomy. One is that as soon as we can get everyone to agree that the truth is going to come from a telescope or some some rover, some robotic rover in outer space, rather than from the Catholic Church or the government, once we can dismiss authority and declare man to be free to do whatever he wants and propose whatever he wants with no accountability, We can introduce all kinds of ideas for our own benefit with no regard for the common good. Whereas God's way always puts the common good first and has no respect for quote-unquote freedom for one man that requires the oppression of another man or the dishonoring of one man for the honoring of another. For example, in the history of medicine, in the 1800s, I believe it was the 1800s, medical researchers became very comfortable with things like autopsies. Whereas in history, men who practiced medicine and studied medicine believed that autopsies were immoral because the body of the dead was sacred. It's supposed to be buried. We we bury someone and we say, may he rest in peace. And the idea is that we set his body to rest in anticipation of the resurrection and we recognize 
the sanctity of the human body. We don't start chopping it up and using it for experiments. We recognize the sanctity of the body. I, for one, would not want my mother's body chopped up and handed over to scientists so they could do some research. I would consider my mother's body to be sacred. I'd want to visit her grave because her body was buried there. And through history, that's how the bodies of the dead were considered. They were considered as sacred. And therefore, what men could do in terms of research was limited by their morals, by their religious beliefs. And when the morals and the religious beliefs are cast aside, now we have this appearance of great research and discovery and breakthrough, whereas it's not science that's creating these discoveries by some kind of method that no one in the past could have conceived. It's that scientists are making use of methods that people in ancient times believed were immoral and not permissible. And now we're to the point in modern society where this has gone so far that things like abortion, where we're not only, we're not only oppressing the body of the dead for our own benefit, but now we're even comfortable oppressing the life of, or the body of the living, as long as that body is hidden in the womb or is in an elderly condition that is no longer capable of sustaining itself without the assistance of other human beings. We consider now even the destruction of the living body to be an option. But this coldness towards the body started long ago. It started when the bodies of the dead were no longer respected. And of course, modern people just embrace all of this so-called science and research. Again, not holding it accountable to morals or philosophical standards, but simply imbibing this idea that Scientific observation is an intrinsic good and that it can never do any wrong. And anyone who objects morally to these things is considered to be a cuckoo. Today we see the zeal among the wealthy to exit the Earth's atmosphere and visit space. And these same people who will be spending millions and millions, if not billions of dollars to travel into space will turn around and in the next breath condemn someone for burning too much fuel in a car on the road. And any reasonable person can spot the contradiction. But in a society that no longer studies reason, in a society where a scientific achievement is considered in a moral vacuum with no accountability to any other principles other than whether or not something new has been achieved, we find that even Christians have become desensitized to the audacity of modern science. Now, when we look specifically at astronomy, we find incredible examples of this contradiction, irrationality, 
and immorality. Let's go to the controversy at the time of Galileo. We have men inventing telescopes. And these telescopes are allowing men to see magnified images of celestial bodies which human eyes may have never seen before, may have. And so a man like Galileo claims that he has seen in his instrument something that the church, who lacks the instruments, is not able to see. And what we see here is that there is a shift there is an attempt to shift the authority from the hierarchy of the church <clears throat> and from the accountability to reason to the authority of the scientist and accountability to the instruments of observation. And Francis Bacon explicitly spoke of the importance of instruments in the scientific revolution. And many interesting implications arise when we give permission for men to claim to see things that cannot be demonstrated. Men can possess evidence that other men don't have access to. One of the reasons why reasoning is so beneficial in investigation and truth-seeking is because it's accessible to all or most men. There's no mystery. But in science, whoever has the most powerful telescope is the only person who's allowed to speak. Because if my telescope is more powerful than yours, you really can't be sure that your observations are true because you can't see them as well as I can. And whoever has the most powerful instrument is the authority. And not only will he have the most powerful instrument and be the authority, but he will also likely have ownership of that instrument and can determine who can use it and who can't. And so we have to ask, is this really how the truth is to be discovered by men? When Galileo proposed his theory that the sun was at the center of the universe, it was rejected by the church not because it was impossible, but because he was unable to demonstrate the truth that he was proposing. And so because he could not demonstrate the truth of what he proposed, and because it was controversial, he was forbidden to publish it. Because the church didn't want some radical new theory being published among the common people, which appeared to contradict sacred scripture and many other historical writings and authoritative sources, the church didn't want some controversial, contradictory teaching to be published among the common people before it had ever been demonstrated. And not only was Galileo not able to demonstrate it, but in time it was proven that his theory was in fact false. But before there could be any demonstration, Galileo rushed to publication, and that's what the church condemned him for. Not that he had some alternative idea about the order of the heavens, but that his theory contradicted the traditional biblical and Aristotelian model and he was unable to demonstrate the truth of it. 
It's just common sense that the church would not allow someone to publish that, especially someone who claimed to be a scientist and who could easily deceive common people who don't have access to his telescopes and don't know if anything he's saying is true or false. And so Galileo was punished by the church. Again, not for being a scientist, but for acting disobediently and irrationally. Now, when Copernicus came along, Copernicus refined the helio, or sun-centered, theory and presented a more accurate explanation of what was visible. And yet, at the same time, we have to remember Einstein's teaching that depending on what we consider to be the starting point of reference, these observations are relative, and they can both be true. Copernicus was more devout than Galileo, more obedient. And presented his theory as a theory, heliocentric theory. However, we have to remember that these two different perspectives have implications in different areas. If we favor the Aristotelian model, we may frustrate some physicists and mathematicians in modern observatories, but we'll make the scriptures and poetry and ancient literature all much more comprehensible. And yet, if we reject the biblical or Aristotelian model of the universe will offend faith and possibly scandalize Christians who will be confused about the truth. And so really, this Copernican theory should be of interest to no one but those working with the calculations of modern astronomy. They have nothing to do with common people or people employed in other areas. And I would even argue that the heliocentric model, the Copernican model, for people not in those kinds of work, is actually detrimental or harmful. It has a negative effect in all different areas of study and thought and life and culture and creates many, many problems. You'll notice that since the founding of the scientific method and the establishment of these modern theories and worldviews, there's been very little in the way of musical production, poetry, and so on. Because it's as if the beautiful glasses with which God intended for us to look at the natural world have been taken from us and thrown away. And we're left to see things in a confusing and different way than the Creator Himself intended for us to see them. And it has all sorts of negative effects in us. But anyway, that's a discussion for another talk. What's important to understand is that Aristotle's astronomy, the classical astronomy, is based on philosophical investigation that is filled with demonstrations. It cannot be easily dismissed unless those demonstrations are shown to be false. And I challenge anyone to do so. The modern astronomy, while it may be true in the sense that we've talked about, is really only of interest to astronomers. 
And we have to wonder why are common people who have nothing to do with the calculation of the orbits of planets or of the size of different celestial bodies, why are people so insistent upon us acknowledging the truth of the heliocentric theory? And we should realize that where there's smoke, there's fire. Something is there. Something is there beneath the surface that tells us that there's something more to this. And what I believe it is, is the general modern anti-Catholic, anti-authoritative, anti-philosophical disposition of modern society. Because with these different doctrines come moral consequences. And that's why I think people are so averse to the ancient astronomy. They know that it comes with moral and religious implications, and that's why it cannot be accepted. So I hope that this is a helpful overview or introduction to the subject of classical astronomy. And as I said, if you're interested in this subject beyond what I've talked about in this talk, I invite you to study it with me in the Classical Astronomy course in the Classical Liberal Arts Academy. And if you're not willing to study the sources that I mentioned, Aristotle's work on the heavens and Ptolemy's Almagest, then I recommend, or rather I request, that you not talk about ancient astronomy, because you've never studied it, you're not willing to study it, And therefore, it makes no sense why it's even in your mouth. Leave these discussions for those who have actually done the work and studied them. And again, I challenge you to study them. Because I think that if you would actually study the ancient philosophy and let Aristotle provide you with all of his proofs, and let Ptolemy present you all of his proofs, you'll never again casually dismiss classical astronomy. I hope that's helpful. If you have any questions or would like me to to deal with any other topics that you can think of based on this talk, I ask you to contact me and let me know. If you've listened to this talk and would like to be notified of, of other talks, please subscribe to the YouTube channel. And, uh, and, and also click the notification button so you're, you're sent a message when new videos are posted. Feel free to comment on any of the videos. And uh, as I said, contact me if you have any questions because I'd be happy to, to follow up on these talks with subsequent talks. And I, I hope to address topics and issues that listeners would like to hear about. Um, and therefore, I, I appreciate very much topic requests like this one, asking for me to talk about classical astronomy. I hope that's helpful and and satisfies something that you were looking for in the topic. If not, please let me know and we'll keep the discussion going and, and get into more detail. God bless you all.